live on YouTube. We're <laughs> live. You're welcome, you Fred. Corrections and Institutions. Uh, this is Wednesday morning, February 7th. And um, we have with us today some folks from DOC. We're going to be talking about um, reentry planning for our folks who are incarcerated and um, just to see where there may be some gaps in that, to see what is working, see what might not be working, and maybe we as a committee can figure out how we move forward with this issue. So Joshua Rutherford is with us. So if you could just introduce yourself for the record, and I know you brought some other folks with you. I did, uh, absolutely. Uh, for the record, Joshua Rutherford, uh, Facility Operations Manager with the Department of Corrections, and reentry is a big topic. So we got back up here. Can you introduce yourselves? Uh, Monique Sullivan, Facility Operations Manager, overseeing uh, caseworking in the facility. And Monique didn't mention it, but she's spent 20 years in Southern State, uh, both as a caseworker and as a living unit supervisor who oversees the caseworker. So a lot of direct experience both in that field, but with some of our most challenging populations who are housed at Southern, as I, I think the committee's aware. Hi, Gary Marble, Field Operations Manager, so probation for all. Monique and I are on the caseworker operations team. Okay, I'll use stretch. So with that, um, oops. Um, with that, um, so there's a bit of a yes, there are some gaps, and so let's start start with like, what does it look like when it goes right, um, and what do we try and do? So there's a whole bunch of different areas that we look at when we're releasing somebody. Um, <laughs> Especially when they have a known mid or a maximum. Uh, under statute, there's uh, obligation to provide uh, identification documents um, to folks if they've been in for a certain amount of time. And Sullivan oversees that process. Uh, so caseworkers ask folks, do you have an ID? Do you need an ID? Do you want our help with an ID? Um, look at residents. Where are you going to live? And that's a huge, huge one. Uh, I don't think I have to speak at all to this committee about the challenges in housing. Uh, very little of our population has uh, significant private resources. Um, they may or may not have had a home before they came in. They were probably, most folks were living somewhere, but that may or may not be somewhere they can return to. If they were renting and they've been in for a while, that may not be available anymore. Um, or it may not meet their needs. Uh, if you were residing somewhere and uh, your life was sort of out of control and you were engaging in criminal activity, maybe that presence wasn't meeting your needs. Um, registry requirements, of course, for uh, folks with sex offenses. Um, we can sign folks up for three squares, Vermont. Um, we work a lot with um, the veteran services. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, Mike Owens, who worked with us from them for probably a decade or more, great guy though, worked really well with us. He's retired. He did a real good warm handoff with his replacement, uh, introduced that person to us. Uh, and they're getting up to speed working with our population, but some of our population is veterans and are entitled to certain benefits or support. So when those are available, that's something we work out. Um, depending on eligibility, you'll get reach up, child, child assistance, fuel assistance. Um, I believe the committee is certainly aware of some of the challenges with Medicare and Medicaid because our commissioner has spoken to you guys about that. Um, but a large portion of our population has ongoing chronic health care needs, um, opiate use disorder, other things that are going to require medical care. Obviously, we want everybody to have medical care when they come out, but some folks have a lot of have needs that need to be immediate when they walk out. Um, so follow up medical appointments and prescriptions, SSI and SSDI, uh, connection to a designated agency for especially for some of our older population who need some help uh, with medical stuff, choices for care. Um, arrangements on substance abuse, voc rehab, um, having somebody pick you up, um, things as simple as printing out your, uh, the bank that you're going to go to, um, that your check is cashed on, making sure that you have that check. Um, for some folks, making sure we'll do a box of food for folks when they're releasing. Um, but trying as much as possible that when somebody walks out the door, we've arranged for all those basic needs. So who, who within a correctional facility would work with the resident there to look at all of these boxes? Is, is it Monique that would do this or, or is it, 
What's the process internally in that facility? So it, it's the caseworker primarily. Medical, our medical contractor does the sort of medical follow-up pieces. Okay, because we've tried in the past that uh, case workers do that and it just gets clunkier and it gets us in the middle of medical care. And frankly, we don't do it that way. Um, so the medical contractor does that. The caseworker is sort of the coordinating spot on all the rest of it. Um, and they do have access to, they're overseen by a living unit supervisor, um, depending on the case uh, and barriers, they can reach out to um, those of us in Central, to Gary and Monique. Um, for individuals who are seriously functionally impaired, we have a separate staffing committee uh, that can review those cases. Those cases can be incredibly difficult to find housing for. Um, and so we can look at some other options there. Colleen Nielsen, who I think has been in to meet with you guys before, um, has some great connections with both Dale and the Department of Mental Health. Um, so we can help arrange things there. So it's the individual caseworker who is, would be under Monique, right? Under Monique in her past position, under the living unit supervisor of the building. Okay. So each incarcerated individual has, has an assigned caseworker, and then there's a living unit supervisor or two uh, in the facility, and they're responsible for overseeing all the caseworkers. And then from a central level, uh, Monique works with all those living unit supervisors to try and keep casework moving appropriately in the right direction in all institutions. So I know we've looked at this for many years, this committee, in terms of reentry planning. And I remember when Mary Solomon, I mean, not Mary Solomon, Mary Hooper, I was on, but was on this committee years ago, we really needed to focus on reentry planning. And we put in initiatives, we put in language, you got to do it. When we go in and talk to folks who are incarcerated, they're clueless about having reentry planning. No, we don't have a plan. Well, I'm sure that there's some reentry planning. It's probably the terminology that is used that the resident can't connect the dots to say this is a reentry plan. It's my hunch. Because I've heard this from, from inmates now, I don't have a reentry plan. Right. And it's like we've been very clear the minute that person comes in, not a detainee, but once they're sentenced, to really work on that reentry. Right. Plan. And I think that's in statute. And that's right. that's the way our directives are written is sort of like reentry planning starts on day one. Exactly. Uh, because so why is it the inmate doesn't understand that's that? Something you can speak to, Monique, a little I, bit? I think you may be correct in saying it's a the terminology. We don't refer to it that way in the facility. We talk about what are you going to do when you get out? Where are you going to go? And eventually we, we get to calling it a release plan, but. See, in that breakdown, in that language, and then it gets relayed to us as legislators, and then we walk away feeling there's no reentry plan. That's how it plays out in the real world. And, and a lot of those, and I know a source of anxiety, I think, for a lot of the population is a lot of the actual details can't be nailed down until we get closer. So um, if, I, if I, you need a residence when you get out, Yes, I can start talking to you about reentry on day one, but if your release date is five years out, we can't work on finding you a residence. That's not going to be helpful. Even even six months out, we can be having those conversations um, and looking for something, but it's very difficult to nail down things concretely. Uh, and I know folks are anxious, and not a lot when you're incarcerated feels like it's in your control, uh, and we'll we'll that will get worked up. Uh, and I get it. But at the same point in time, from the caseworker's point of view, there, there are timelines with some of those things where you really can't start crossing paths until we get close enough for it to make a difference. We have another question here, Michelle. Well, it's more a comment, or I guess it's partly a question. So just looking at these many different things, I guess I'm curious from your perspective, you know, at this point in time, how many of these things are getting done for most people before they release? Because like I used to work in reentry. And many of those things were not done before they came to me in the community justice center. I was helping people get insurance, get mental health referrals, get Medicaid, all of those things that it felt like they should happen before. And that was right around the time of COVID and things mm -hmm. were hectic. So I'm wondering now, how different is that? Because certainly not all of those things historically, at least not that long ago, were able to happen before folks were released. So I'm just going to draw your attention to the word optimal up there yeah. uh, because yeah. this really is the plan and this is what we want to do. This is the goal. This is sort of the expectation. Um, and we'll get in a minute to some of the barriers on that. I think when we have a defined sentence for somebody uh, and they're, they're reasonably cooperative, which, which most folks are in this, 
Um, I think the majority of these things are addressed. They're not all relevant to all people, um, but I think the majority of these things are addressed. It's part of our um, reentry checklist that the caseworkers have to go through. Um, I know essentially we don't review all cases, but there's a number of specific cases where there's triggers where we have to review. And these are the questions we ask. Uh, you know, where, what have you done with, with these things? Is this set up? And when we go, okay, that's a good plan. It means that we've addressed the need areas for this person that fall into these categories. Um, and so for instance, sex offenders need to be centrally staffed before they go out. Somebody who's designated uh, release sensitive notification, uh, some of our other sort of higher risk releases. Um, and th consistently we'll see They've hit most of this, or we'll go, okay, you got this, have you followed up on X or Z? Um, but I think for folks where we have a defined sentence and where where folks are reasonably cooperative, I think most of this is getting done. I think we'll get to barriers in a second. I think there's a number of cases where for various reasons it's not. So just one other thing I would add to, and it wouldn't be relevant for all um, people that have been incarcerated, but... Um, I mean, I would hope that for those who were eligible in terms of folks who had uh, been serving felony sentences, that you would also check in with folks about, hey, would a COSA be appropriate for you and matching them to a community justice? Oh, you wait. You okay. wait. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. Perfect. That's that is its very own slide. Okay. All right. Awesome. Thanks. That's common. Uh, Chip? Is there still such a thing that was known as gate money? Um, you put there, money in the pockets of these? Uh, men, so right? we do have that option. Um, a lot of times... Um, that'll focus on um, on housing stuff um, as opposed to sort of cash in the pocket um, that hasn't always worked so well for us um, or necessarily for the folks who are incarcerated. But yeah, there is a there is a process for that. Um, it gets requested to, through the superintendent. There is money for it. Uh, and especially in the housing front is where I think we spend the bulk of that. Um, but yeah, that is that is still an option. Um, Thanks, Josh. They have a question. Yeah, just on it. So once the commissary balance get checked out, send out the door with them. I was... if, if they have anything on their books, it's theirs. Uh, and so I think I've got it up here, balance of account. Um, when you walk out the door, uh, if you've got a balance on your account, you, you walk out with a check. Um, and uh, if Ms. Sullivan is your caseworker, um, directions to the bank where that check is drawn off of. Uh, and of course, if you've been employed while well incarcerated uh, and VCI, I don't know if they, are they still doing the matching program? I think, do you know? Okay. I know, I know if you're working through VCI, you get, certainly you get paid. And I know we used to do that matching program. I'm not sure on the status. We've decimated VCI. We're not going down that road. <laughs> not my area of expertise. Okay. We have another question, John. Oh, sorry. Huh? Actually, it's the reinforcement of what uh, Michelle had said. Um, a fellow that I don't deal with quite a bit that works with some of these people and ends up taking is that a lot of these boxes aren't checked when people come out. Uh, do you take people's word that they've met some of these criteria, or do you actually follow up to make sure that do they have a place to stay or are they going to couch their? <laughs> so, in terms of residence, it depends on whether or not a residence is required. Um, not everybody is required to have a residence for release, and we've done a lot of work, and there's been a lot of concern from this committee and others about us holding folks simply because they don't have a place to live. Uh, and so we've tried to strike a balance on that. And some folks, uh, and there's specific policy language on this, some folks are required to have a place to live, and we, uh, we verify that, and somebody goes out and checks that, and we make sure that that's an appropriate place to live. Um, for a number of other folks, if they're lower risk, we don't require that they have a place to live. Okay. We will ask them. Uh, they will tell us. We will help support them. Um, but if they if they don't, uh, if they're telling us they they may be going out to couch surf, um, and it is striking that balance of trying not to hold folks in jail just because they don't have a place to live, unless that's necessary to manage their risk and. Uh, I guess in some respects, there's no great answer on either side of it. Um, I don't want to hold somebody in jail just because they don't have a place to live. And I also don't want to release people homeless. So uh, I, I think there's a, a balance point to hit there. And those aren't always great answers on either side. So pre-COVID, and, and probably about 2016, 17, 18, 19, we had up to at least 150 people that we were holding due to lack of housing. 
they had met their men, they did everything okay in corrections, and um, they weren't being released because of lack of house. It was around 150. So. Involuntarily or be voluntarily? What do you mean, involuntarily or voluntarily? Well, you don't have a place to stay. You, you, don't, you don't have a residence to stay at when you get out of here. You've got to stay. The AOC was holding right. that because they didn't have housing. Yes. And I do have some information coming up on our V1. Let's and, get there. And that got up to as high as 150. So you look at this and they're low risk. They've met all their conditions, but they don't have appropriate housing. So we were taking up 150 of our beds for folks. So that was a percolating issue in this body and saying, look, we need to free up these beds. So we put in, I think there's legislation, there was legislation of uh, making sure that we don't hold someone back due to lack of housing, that they can be released once they reach their men, if they're- If they're appropriate for that. Yes. And I do have some information on that. So how many folks are, do we have now, do you know, that were, um, that are incarcerated and lack of housing? We'll have a whole slide on that. It, but I don't want to get ahead of myself yeah, too much sorry, here. We're getting ahead no, of it's okay. Um, I'm going to click over to Gary, though, to explain the FACT program here. Yeah, so thanks, George. Um, so the, the FACT program is a pilot that I think a lot of you have heard about. And it's sort of like an ideal that we, we strive towards. Uh, it, it's a collaborative grant-funded project that we have going on at Burlington between DMH, Pathways, and DOC. Um, it's you know, currently funded through SAMHSA. And it's a federal grant. And what it really does is kind of provides what we would like to ideally provide for all of the high needs individuals coming out so from the facility. Um, it gives wraparound services where you have uh, part of the So there's the certain um, staff that are required as part of the model. You need to have a psychiatrist, you need to have a peer support individual, somebody for uh, employment, somebody for education if you need that, a nurse. Um, as a team leader, we have two trained staff uh, POs that have gone through similar training as the pathways employees. Uh, we have a correct, community correctional officer who's kind of oriented towards more like support rather than compliance. It's a more typical role for that, for that position. Um, and basically what we do is kind of sure up all of the, the gaps that are missing uh, when someone comes into the community and, and typically struggles. These are for generally for people that have gone in and out, in and out, and we tried all the conventional interventions with them in the past but haven't had much success. Um, so right now we have, I think it's uh, 25 individuals that are being served in the community in Burlington. And I think we've done around 40 total since the project started, since we got all this rolling. Um, and we'd like to expand this if it's, if it's possible. Um, you know, Burlington was the first place we started because we figured we can't do it in Burlington we're not gonna do it anywhere else. Because it's just that you can't throw a rock without hitting a nonprofit in, in Burlington. So this RAP, there's lots of support in the community. Um, but, you know, if we could ever get it to every place in the state, then I think it would be a really great way for the people that tend to come up, um, tend to come back over and over again and, and tend to be some of that B1 list that you're referring to that ends up coming in with black housing. Um, so that's something that we're doing right now. We're hoping to expand it. I need a chip. So what kind of success have you had? Can you measure any success yet? Um, we're still looking at the data, but I want to, um, and I, I don't have numbers, just to be clear. Um, I want to point out, though, that this is a population that habitually goes back over and over and over again. So compared to the general population of people that we have on supervision, even success will still look like they're going back at a higher rate. Right. But you, you, are, you know what rate they were going back at when they entered the program. And you should be able to, yeah. with 40, 40 is a decent sample size. I, I can tell you anecdotally, um, they're, they're definitely staying in the community longer. Yeah, they're, I mean, absolutely <clears throat> staying in the community for a much, much higher rate than they were before. I just don't want to give you numbers that yeah. later on are, are factual. Yeah. So <clears throat> um, I guess my question is some folks have very intense needs. Um, and, you know, from my experience, I've seen... Uh, folks being released who are eligible for CRT, which is a very expensive and time consuming uh, program. And I'm wondering if that transition actually happens. I mean, it's a real difficult situation because our designated agencies are not always prepared to provide CRT for, uh, for individuals, including uh, folks that are being released. And I'm just wondering if that's been part of 
what you're dealing with here in this program. Yeah, and you know, I want to be transparent about what we're confronting in the community. And I know you're all aware, you know, we have designated agencies that have been at 50% staffing for years now. Uh, and this was kind of in some ways a let's do it ourselves model. We were like, you know, we know the model exists. Uh, let's get the funding for it. Let's work directly with uh, a contractor and EMH. So we're, we're kind of providing a lot of what CRT would ideally be providing if um, the staffing wasn't so grim in the communities. Um, I don't think it's happening at the, the level it should be. And I think it's, I think it's really geographically um, uh, deficit. Yeah, some that yeah. Be the case, yeah. But, I mean, CRT is 24-7 you know, supervision, and some folks really need it and can't get by without it, really. So, And I know one of the challenge areas for us around that is – not folks who are CRT eligible, but folks who fall just shy of that front row. Yeah. Who really could use most of that support, yeah. but don't quite. And I know Colleen does a lot of work on that. Uh, but those are some of the most challenging cases where they, sure. and man, you could really use all that, but don't quite get whatever those requirements right. are. Right. So say you're not, say you don't have a serious mental illness, but you, you have clearly complex needs. Yep. We can do that with you now through this because we use some of the JRI money left over uh -huh. that isn't covered by the grant because the grant only covers the, the SMI population for yeah. this. And we use that for the people with the complex needs that might not have a diagnosis like schizophrenia or what personality or something like that. A lot of it is still diagnosis, though. I mean, there's yeah. a lot of cognitive deficiencies that uh, uh, combine with mental health issues that really um, uh, make up a lot of this population. Yeah, and, and sometimes you can't even get a clear diagnosis because yeah. they're so wrapped yeah. up in substance use. And you know, so you don't know how much of it is driven yeah. by that and by you know organic issues. So wow. thank I'm, you. I'm gonna ask one, I know Tristan has a question, but on this line, if someone is designated while they're incarcerated as SFI, then they are released, do they automatically go into the CRT? Um, they meet the eligibility typically because we've aligned, uh, my understanding, Colleen can speak better to this, but my understanding is that we've aligned it so that that's, that's pretty much the same criteria as CRT, but we can never control whether or not, you know, the designated agency accepts them into CRT. I mean, I think that would be the ideal and we try to align it so that is the case. Um, but once they're in the community, you know, we don't have control over that. So. That question came up yesterday, folks, if you remember. Um, and I know in the past, when we tried to have that seamless transition before we had the designation of SFI totally within mm -hmm. correction, there was pushback from the DAs that, hey, wait a minute, you're putting these folks who are returning from an incarcerative setting at priority above the other CRT folks who are in the community. And we don't want to do that. So straighten it out. Well, and, and refuse them. Oh, I'm sorry. They refuse them. They'll refuse them. Like a good example, uh, class that we talked about this yesterday. Um, you know, you designate agency. We have designated agencies that won't work with sex offenders. They won't work with people with sexual offenses in their history. So, um, you know, in those cases, we have to kind of do what we can to support them if the designated agency won't do it. And sometimes they'll say things like, "We won't work with them until they've completed um, sex offender treatment," which takes years. You know, it takes a couple of years in the community. Sometimes up to three years. You know, obviously their needs are going to be not met during that time frame. So that's a problem. We also struggle with sometimes folks don't want to work with our individuals who have failed repeatedly. Well, uh, who have failed repeatedly. And we do see a very high failure rate with, with this sort of complex population. And we, we will always work with them. We don't have, I guess we don't have a choice not to. Uh, but we will have designated agencies who, yep, they've been here. We've offered them services previously. They were threatening. They were violent. Um, okay, but now they are coming back out into the community and they still need that support. Uh, so that has been a challenge area for us. So one more thing, when the Council of State Governments was looking at all of this back in 2019, 2020, it was prior to COVID and Justice Reinvestment II came about. One thing that was really clear that the Council of State Governments said, our partners in the community are not coming through. And it's all falling on DOC's budget to provide those support systems to folks who are re-entering when it should be our community partners that are doing this, like your DAs. So that's why we put in, I believe it was 400,000, and I think it was 400,000, I don't think it was 200,000, into the Department of Mental Health back in 2021 to beef up those services. And the Department of Mental Health, I think, took two years to figure out how to use that money if they've used it. 
because we had them come back to testify a few years after, and they didn't know what to use the money for. But we intentionally put in, for, I think it was 400000 for the Department of Mental Health to beef up those services in the community to be provided for folks who are reentering. Yeah, and often we're not the best people to provide those services. DOC. DOC. DOC isn't. And um, I think across the board, um, there's not some of those social services in the community just aren't there. And you can't connect folks with resources that aren't there. So the goal was to beef up our community providers to help take care of our folks who are reentering and take the pressure off the of DOC's budget because they're not, that's not what DOC is skilled at doing. It's what our community mm -hmm. providers is. Well, and, and there's still that breakup. There's still that. And absent those supports, the folks end up back incarcerated. And, yeah. and that's certainly not the thing that anybody's looking for. So, Tristan, I interrupted, but I wanted that thread. No <clears throat> issues. I mentioned this the last time back came up in the committee, but since you're here and talking about it, I wanted to share that you know, I have a constituent who said, Hey, I have a good, I have a positive correction story for you. You must get hundreds of those, I'm sure. <laughs> My phone rings off of it sometimes. <laughs> uh, and uh, I said, well, what's that? And uh, she said, uh, you know, her son's been working with FACT in Burlington. It's, it's really working. It's really helpful. So I just want to pass that on. Thank you. Yeah. How long is that pilot project for? Oh, well, we're hoping to continue it. We're hoping to re up the grant, but it's uh, we've been running it now for about two years. And when does it expire? That oh, um, I think I want to say we have to re up it in July. I want to say oh, this year, uh, two, so yeah, where's the grant from? Samson, yeah. and we need to create manage Like I said earlier, we use some justice reinvestment money to cover the people that the Samson grant can't cover. Because that's only under you have to have a serious mental illness for to be under that funding source. So that allows us to fold in people with complex needs and don't meet the diagnostic criteria, which there are many. So jumping on to COSA, and and I think we could probably do a short presentation uh, on solely on fact and solely on coastal like those are big topics so these are just just little bites um there is later in that presentation there's a uh more complex slide with a whole bunch of information on cosa uh and a more complete presentation on fact that's just there for you guys um but we only have a limited time monique or gary did either you want to take cosa or you want me to um usually it happens outside so yeah, I'm not sure how, how deep to go into it. I mean, um, we, you know, it, I mean, for those of you that don't know, it's it's a wraparound program involving volunteers. Uh, it was developed out of Canada. We support it through the community justice centers. Um, so it's, we have some experience with that on the committee. Um, and we know that it works really well for individuals that, like we've used it particularly with people coming out who've been in for a while, people with sex offenses who don't have a lot of natural supports. It's um, you know, it's not, it, it's a wraparound support, but it's not, you know, they're not trained like you would see like a FAC model where they have like roles such as like a peer support or a employment specialist. It's really just about getting people into the community uh, and then having other people in the community already there to help just integrate them and have somebody to support them and talk to you. So, I mean, it, it, we know it reduces recidivism. We know it got a lot of positive support. Um, I can tell you, when I was a probation officer, I had multiple people stay on their COSA past the one year agreement. So they would opt to stay on for like another year. Um, so, you know, generally when uh, people on supervision are volunteering to stay on something, it's a positive thing. Um, and yeah, it, it's, it's something that we continue to do and continue, you know, want to expand as, as much as possible. And we, you know, we always need volunteers. So, if you know, anybody send them our way. It's most strongly evidence-based for high-risk sex offenders, or high-need sex offenders. Uh, not high-risk, high-need. Uh, however, Vermont was one of the first to expand that program to support some other populations that are also high-need. Uh, and have had some good success with that. We did do some work with UVM and McMaster University. It was a while ago, but matched populations uh, and did see uh, a significant, Not, I mean, it's not a magic bullet. I mean, it doesn't fix it, um, but a significant reduction across the board in recidivism for all populations served. Uh, so it helps. 
Uh, a lot of folks in our custody don't come in with strong community connections or strong pro-social community connections. Uh, and to be able to go out uh, and have some of those. Uh, I was speaking with Derek Mendelnik about it yesterday, and he said, you know, that's really where it most helps is in that, that peer and social connections and then um, figuring out how to, how to fill time pro-social in the community. Um, in substance abuse, folks often start with, I'm not going to use drugs. Using drugs takes a lot of time. Uh, it really does. If you've worked with substance abusers, you spend a lot of time looking for drugs, you spend a lot of time getting high, you spend a lot of time recovering. And when folks say, I'm not going to use, there's a vacuum in their day uh, that just, that hours, that is now unaccounted for. Uh, and so what I usually hear is, well, I'm just going to work all the time. That's not how human beings work. And COSA has been helpful in sort of filling some of those gaps and connecting people to, what are the, some of the pro-social things that you can do in your community. You need a to-do, not just a not-to-do. Uh, and so it has been helpful in that regard. Josh, there's one thing I could add. Um, it, we, you were talking earlier about uh, individuals that um, you know, required housing, for example. And one of the things that's great about COSA is that, um, so whenever we require something, like come, having someone to come meet with us more often, it, it, it always, it, it's, this, it's this balance of compliance for support uh, in terms of how we supervise. What I like about COSA, what the feedback we've gotten is that like we only meet with someone for you know, an hour, maybe an hour and a half to go check on them in the community as well. Um, so we don't really know how they're doing, you know, but when we have a COSA volunteer team wraparound or, or fact, we get more input. Um, so we can often intervene when someone's struggling and they're not, you know, they might be ashamed of the fact they're struggling. They might be misrepresenting what they're going through. You know, if they've lost a job and they don't want to tell us, like you can work with them. Um, if they're having a struggle with their landlord, we can start, you know, coordinating around that. But we'll get more input if there's more people talking to them, working with them for hours on end, you know, throughout the week, rather than just us, you know, coming into the office, them coming to the office, us talking with them. So that's why I think that's a big component of why these programs tend to do a lot to help support people and help them have more success with their community. All right, so uh, B1 list, that's our lack of housing list. Uh, and as Chair Emmons said, at one point, that was in the range of 150. Uh, when I drew these numbers uh, two days ago, uh, we have 54. Uh, 54 folks who are held solely for lack of housing. Uh, so it's a significant reduction. Uh, I think I've testified before that for a number of those folks, you know, that number may stay the same. I may have 50 or 60, but a lot of the people change. A lot of folks are on that list for a comparatively short period of time. Um, there are also some folks who, who get stuck on it, um, who really have needs that we have trouble finding a place for. Um, over 75% over of those are, are listed convictions. Um, and if you look here uh, between, I'm sorry, between high and very high, that's more than half of those folks on that list are in those high or very high categories and another very significant chunk in moderate. So really only a handful of folks on that who are low risk. Um, I think it was four, three or four, I think, when I, when I ran those numbers. Um, so a lot of progress there. Um, I, I really give a lot of credit to the caseworkers for their work on that, uh, especially given the current housing market. Um, and the lack of residences that we have this few people who are being held for that. Um, I think in a perfect world, I'd always love to see that number at zero. Um, I, I don't know, I don't honestly believe I'll ever see that, um, but certainly that's where we'd, we'd love to get to, that's the target. Um, but we've got some really significant reduction in that in the last several years. At what point is somebody's incarceration at the risk level, sorry. So uh, it's a little static and dynamic. So you have you have static factors that that won't change over the course of your of your time on supervision, but we integrate that with dynamic risk instruments as well. So we have like a chart basically. So as you're doing well on supervision, your risk goes down. Um, and what I want to say about the low risk folks is that just because they're low risk doesn't mean that they're um, they're not reoffending. And a lot of times that's what you're seeing with the low risk folks is that they are continually picking up charges. And that's one of the reasons why we don't want them. We'll decide at some point that, you know, after a certain amount of time, 
certain amount of time coming back that, you know, you need a house, you need a place to live. We used to have um, the, the statute I think you might've been referring to might've been 808F, where we used to require that if they were low risk, yeah, and we repealed that because one of the reasons we found that a lot of folks, when they don't have stable housing, um, they, they just keep picking up new charges. Um, what we have done with justice reinvestment is that we now look at it in terms of, you know, uh, what's their risk level and what's their, how, how many times are they picking up significant violations? And we've, we no longer require everybody on furlough to have a, a place to live. Um, the, the three different levels are, you, you have to tell us where you are going to live. And that might be a low risk individual that, you know, we decide, okay, it's, it's reasonable that you have a community. Um, we don't need to know, um, you know, if it's an approvable residence or not, you just got to tell us where we can find you. The second one is we, where the level is, we can tell you where not to live. Like, for example, you, can, you can't live with your victims, right? But you can still live anywhere else you want. And then the last level is, is for conditions 22, which is people that are high risk where they have like a contact sex offense. And those individuals, they, they, we have to approve their residence. So, um, and it, it, so what I'm saying is that we've, we've made it much more risk and needs based than it used to be. It's not just a one size fits all. When you're talking about risk, <clears throat> I want to be clear, we're all on the same page in terms of how we're interpreting it. Is that risk to reoffend? Um, yeah, ri risk to reoffend. Um, yeah, yeah, I would say broadly speaking, that's what we're talking about. So I just want everybody to be on the same page. because Yeah, we're not talking about sort of like institutional classification. Uh, this is that. So risk to reoffend. Yeah, that's what we're looking at. And then do you also work through and in terms of the severity of the crime in that matrix as well, yep. or and, and then, higher severity in crime, but it, but you're a low risk to reoffend, would track a little different than if you had moderate risk to reoffend, but a very low severity in crime. Yeah, so we break it down. Like for example, the, the ones that we require. Um, so you know, you might be someone who is relatively moderate risk to reoffend, but the type of offense that you had is so severe that we want to make sure that we have to approve your housing. So for example, if you're a contact sex, uh, you have a sex offense, um, you, you might be a moderate risk. We still want to know where you live. For somebody who you know is a moderate risk, but they're not on for a list of crime, not violent, we, we're not going to require you to, to provide an approved residence. I know one of those gentlemen, one of the four who's low is in on a, is in on a murder, a uh, right. murder one conviction. Um, so yes, he's low risk. Yes, we're still going to require that he has an approved residence before he comes out. So one thing that we did, and this may be getting into too much of the weeds, but one thing that we did for beds for these B1s, for the B1s, instead of taking up a hard bed in one of our central facilities, um, when there was a proposal to close beds in St. John's Bird for the work camp, we converted <coughs> those. It kind of looks like a barracks. Yep. We converted that to say we could have B1s. Are the B1s going there still? Oh, okay. Some, and it depends on whether or not that, that unit can meet their needs and that facility can meet their needs. Um, that campsite, um, like you said, it's kind of a barrack style. It's an open dorm with bunks. Uh, for folks with serious mental illnesses, generally doesn't work. Um, for folks who um, have sort of advanced medical needs, that's not the right place. Um, so. Yes, we do house a number of B1s there, um, but we also have some in other places because we need their needs. Or if somebody's maybe close to finding an appropriate residence and they're working with a caseworker, um, usually I don't do the movement anymore, but I did until September or so. Um, no, I'm working with this guy. We think we're almost there. Okay, I'm going to leave him in Northwest for another couple of weeks so you guys can finish working. If in three more weeks we haven't gotten anywhere, then we'll transfer him over to Northeast. Uh, and they can pick it up over there. Um, but don't want to upset the apple cart if you think you're, as a caseworker, making progress, getting close to something. Um, so yeah, there's, there's some of them are there and, and then some for various reasons. That's just not an appropriate setting. So do you have empty beds there at the old work camp? Yep. The empty beds. Because the work camp had what, 50 beds? That's so what yeah, 50 and beds. Was another 50 beds for the- Another, 50, another 56 um, at the moment. Um, one of those entire units is empty. We have about 56 beds and we've combined both into the other. Um, yeah. Um, we would, in an ideal world, I keep those two populations separate, but from a staffing perspective, we only have 40 or 50 people in that entire building. It just didn't make sense to run two separate units. 
Uh, I think everybody in there is fairly uh, low custody. Um, that work camp eligible population um, just has continued to diminish. Um, we really aren't sending a lot of those folks to jail anymore. Um, and I know I've spoken before that from 22, 2,400 people in custody down to 1,300, that work camp population that used to be 200 folks has really continued to diminish over the years. Uh, and we've looked a number of times sort of at that criteria and uh, what we can do with that. But really, we're trying not to incarcerate folks who are low enough risk and who are that type of low risk. If I can bring you out into the community and give you a chainsaw to do some work and I've got one officer watching 10 of you, do I actually need you to be incarcerated to keep the community safe? And I think that's, that's a population that we have less and less of. At one point, we had over 200 thefts. Yeah, well, we had all of the uh, St. Johnsbury camp, and then we had all of, all of Windsor. Um, and I know there's, you know, some other states operate camps, and I've heard here and there, hey, could we do that? Yes, if you want to reincarcerate folks who are currently not in our custody, I'd really prefer you didn't do that. Like, we've done a lot of progress in that regard. Uh, and if those folks are, are not in our custody, uh, we prefer they not be. I'm going to put a thought out, and I'm really nervous doing this because I know sometimes you kind of, say as legislators and kind of, well what if and then all of a sudden it gets out there in the social media world oh they're doing this but i just want food for thought would it be possible at some point for those hundred beds at the st john's Square facility to be used as re-entry program for the men for the men at some point we I think that'd be a bigger conversation. Yeah. My boss is over here. Yeah. Um, I, I think that'd be a bigger conversation. No. Um, no. no. Josh is in charge. <laughs> Just a for the one, one caveat that comes right to mind immediately is what services there are immediately available uh, in the St. John's area and how those, many of those folks are going to go back to the St. John's area. And the answer to both those questions is very few and very few. Uh, and we had the same sort of conversation around Windsor, which I think in many great regards would have been a great place to do reentry, except that you're not going back to Windsor and there's not services there. So um, some potential. And again, we would still have that problem around um, folks whose needs just aren't going to be met with that physical structure. It really is a, a true minimum custody uh, physical structure and open dorm living. Uh, and that just doesn't work for everybody. Um, so to put it on the table. No, I no, I we've done a lot. We've had a lot of conversations about what do we do with that space um, because our needs over the years have changed. Um, and and I think we still have those conversations and we floated a couple of different ideas about what we do with that. Um, if we had an easy solution, we, we would have done that by now. So it's still a work in progress. Okay, did you have something? My concern is what is the what do, what does the community think about? In terms of what? We're, we don't have a work camp because we're letting them go. Mm -hmm. So offenses have occurred in communities and people don't like that. And we let them go. People don't like that. So, you know, is justice being served? Seems like a great policy decision uh, that should probably be made in, in this building here. It's the court that sentences. It's just a, just a thought. Okay. Well, and you know, when I, when I started in corrections, that camp was, was mostly folks serving on DUI. Yeah. Um, and many of those folks are not incarcerated anymore. And again, that really is a policy decision for the legislature. Do we want to be incarcerating folks for lengthier periods of time for, for DUI? Uh, and if you say yes, and the judiciary sends them, corrections will meet that need. If you say, as a state, that's really not an appropriate or the best approach to this particular problem, then they won't come to corrections, or at least they won't come to incarcerate corrections. So barriers. Um, I believe Representative Boslin suggested that maybe this doesn't happen all the time. Um, and, and we are aware of that. Uh, and I know Representative uh, Torino, you've mentioned a couple of times those sort of releases in January with nothing set up. Uh, and those are those are very discouraging to us too. Um, when somebody walks out and they're not prepared, um, 
that doesn't feel good to us either. Um, detainees is one of the biggest drivers in that. Um, detainees can be let go at any point in time. Um, we can we can't do a lot of work with them, and then when we do do that work, everything's sort of up in the air because we don't know when somebody actually is going to leave. Yeah, I'm working with my attorney. I think I'm going to get out. Okay, maybe you will. Maybe you won't. Maybe you're right. Maybe you're not. I can't put something in place based on I think you're going to get out when you go to your next court appearance, or you're not. Um, and folks absolutely get out with us having very very little warning, um, and and that poses a challenge. Uh, and as a system, I don't, I don't know that we have a solution to that. We we certainly work with those folks to the extent possible. Um, but as long as we have folks who are detained in our system who are going to be released um, at the will of the court with with little or no notice to us, um, there's going to be some folks where we can't do comprehensive release planning. Is that mostly the detaining population that you're referring to? Yep. Yeah. Specifically, the detaining population. Um, one of the other folks that were one of the other groups we're seeing. Uh, especially with the backlog in um, in courts is folks who um, are sentenced and have sort of time served or credit satisfies their sentence. So you detainee get, population, you mean? Yeah, so we're starting with detainees, but also if somebody gets sentenced today and their credit satisfies, and that happens a lot, and um, not to look at any form of defense counsel in the room, um, but... Um, Why are you looking at me? <laughs> I have no idea. I have no idea. Um, but... Sometimes that's that's kind of the deal. Is I'm going yeah. to I'm going to plead to this. I'm going to take a, a deal for two years, knowing that I have two years uh, in, and now I'm immediately eligible for release. Uh, and so again, those are folks. It's very difficult for us to concretely arrange for release. Um, incapacitated persons, uh, and I know that this has come up uh, in this committee a number of times over the years. Uh, incapacitated persons has always been an odd fit for corrections because it's a policy decision that's not criminal behavior. Um, and they come to us. Uh, we have very limited scope with those folks. We can hold them for a very limited amount of time. Uh, and we are legally obligated to release them uh, at the end of that time. Um, so we really don't do release planning with those folks. Um, and how could you? Because we release them as soon as they're sober. And it's very difficult to do release planning with somebody who's intoxicated. Um, so when you look at the data in terms of if someone's been incarcerated or impact, whatever, they've been in a facility and then they're released. And then you see the gaps in terms of these boxes in your first screen mm -hmm. were not met. You need to do a deeper dive <coughs> to find out, well, was this person an in-cap person? Because I'm assuming that person would show up on the data. Well, it's, it's always when I get those when I get those you know concerns around this person didn't release that's usually the first thing I look at is what was their legal status and why did they get released and then we can start looking at did somebody drop the ball because we are not perfect and there are times when for various reasons things that should happen don't also there are certainly plenty of times where we didn't have the notice where be, there was a change in their status such that they were released. So what I'm saying, you got to do a deeper dive, even though you see this, mm -hmm. you've got to look in terms of is a person was a person a detainee that's been there for two years, for three years, and finally got sentenced, and it was credit for time stamp, so they got released, or it was an in cap person. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm trying to get at. So the data could show a lot of these holes. Do you think, oh, my God, all these folks are getting released, but you got to do a deeper dive in terms of those folks to find out what their status was. Was it actually sentenced folks who met their men and were out, or is it folks of the detainee population? And, and a third of our population is detainees. So this is not that a small group. You, how you oh, absolutely. Them. Without a doubt. Great. Yeah, that's been the question that's brewing for me. Um, I don't doubt that these barriers exist at all. Um, and we haven't even covered most of these categories yet. Um, and at the same time, we're still hearing consistently anecdotal testimony of release was horrendous for me. Um, so there's, this is that gap, right? And, and, and I pay attention when those gaps show up. And sometimes they're really small little gaps that are easily explained as you're trying to do today. Sometimes those gaps are bigger. Like what we're hearing from this side is so vastly different from what we're hearing consistently from this side. And I think, and I don't have data in front of me, this feels like a pretty big gap between what we're hearing on either side of the equation. 
I don't know if you can do this, but what percentage of the folks who have stayed with you are, are encapsulated by, by these barriers? Is it 75%? Is it 20%? I'd have I'd have to work with Jess. I, I and that's really, the data. That yeah, no, I certainly don't have to... I certainly don't have those numbers. Um, and I think they'd be challenging to get to, but <laughs> we can work with Jess and see what we can kind of figure out. <clears throat> like I said, that detainee population is a third of our population, and the part that moves rolls over quickest. So to be more not sure. So I mean, that in and of itself is a significant portion right there. Okay. I can appreciate. Um, Comments on credit for time served. I can't tell you the number of times that I would drive a client back to the correctional center, pick up their belongings and take them as far as I could to wherever they might be heading. And um, it's a it's a sad story that it happens that way, but it is part of what the system is about. And um, certainly, um, you know, uh, we're not going to recommend somebody to serve more time. No, no. And I wouldn't ask the judiciary to do that. You know, like, that's not what we're asking. Yeah, no, I, I understand that. I'm just saying that, you know, in general, that uh, it's a, it's, it is a, a, a problem that is really difficult to, uh, to approach uh, as far as planning for a release. So let's keep going because we do have some. I'm worried about our schedule this morning because we have if you, scheduled at 930. That's just a little bit, I think. So um, we do have, uh, most folks really do want to cooperate and work with us on uh, release planning. Um, we do have a small population, uh, especially around max out cases where they don't. Um, fixed date release dates and flexible release dates both have their own um, challenges to them and we, f we face with both. Either way, if we have a release date, it's better than not having a release date. Um, but if you have a, say, split to probation, you're going to be released on this day. We can work on finding something, work on getting you a residence. But if that's not ready on the day you get out, you still have to get out that day. Um, and again, some of those split to serve will also be with credit for time served. Um, and then with, with the flexible release dates, your normal standard mid max. Um, again, you're looking for that residence that comes together. You want to get somebody out while that apartment is available. Um, but we couldn't finalize your medical appointments until we know what community you're going to. So those we usually overcome, um, but there can be a bit of a scramble. So those are just, those are both, those are, those are the two categories. Again, those are the preferable. If I have a release date to work with, we're way better than if we didn't. Um, but there are just some challenges associated with both of those scenarios where somebody either has a really fixed date uh, or they, they have kind of a flexible one. Go ahead, Gary. Yeah, I just want to add just as an example of like where we might have a release plan uh, along the way that gets derailed by externalities we don't control. Like we'll have some, like I, I'm thinking of one recently where we had someone with a release plan to go out of state. Um, and then at the last minute, we found out that the state wasn't going to take him. Um, and then all of a sudden we're scrambling to put that person in a hotel room to keep him away from his victim. And we're moving around from the hotel room until we could find another uh, option for him and another in, in the state. I think it was uh, actually, it was Puerto Rico. I didn't want to go ahead. And so, you know, we have cases like that where, you know, we had a plan for like a year and then it falls apart and, you know, we don't control the ICOT system. So, you know, the, so a lot of times you might be hearing about situations where things went awry, where there was a plan. We did all the work, all the necessary steps, but then, you know, we had to scramble at the last minute because something went south. So I just want to throw that out there is that might be some of the cases you're hearing because you're probably going to hear about the cases that went poorly and we're the ones that went well. So... And then, of course, lack of community, level of community resources and how much that varies from community to community. Um, and I don't, I think this group is amply aware of, of that challenge. Um, there's, there's a lot of things in, say, Burlington, there's very little in Essex. Um, so if we jump to the next slide, what I've got here is four specific case examples. Um, these are representative, but these are individual human beings. And that's what it comes down to when we're doing this is we have people that we have challenges with and barriers. Um, so um, about two Fridays ago uh, at 9 a.m., uh, court suddenly changed somebody's legal status uh, and we were obligated to release that individual that day. Now, I actually appreciated this one because it was 9 a.m. and the joke in both, she, she's laughing, the joke in both uh, Department of Mental Health and Corrections is that this happens at 4.30 on a Friday, not 9 a.m. Uh, the individual, was SFI designated? 
He had a sex condition, so he has registry requirements, and he has a probation condition not to be near folks who are under 18. He has no money, he has no residence, and his family is 800 miles away. And the family may not want him. The family, actually, the family in this case would wanted to be supportive. Right. He has to stay in the state of Vermont because he's on probation. It's a split to serve. He has to be in the state of Vermont. The family would like to be supportive. They're 800 miles away. They have limited resources themselves. Uh, and so at, I think, 930 or 945, there's half a dozen of us from the field, from the facility, and from Central on a conference call trying to figure out what can we pull together for services for this individual before the end of the day. Uh, and uh, we did have a, we had a community partner that stepped up. Um, we had already had his, we knew release was possible coming up. So we had his IDs already. Um, those were already done and just sort of waiting for when he did get released. Um, and so we managed to pull together. He walked out, he went, he got picked up, he went to a place, um, but that was a hard day's work by a number of folks uh, on sort of a last minute situation with a number of barriers. Um, incapacitated person, uh, fairly well known to us. He's been in and out for a number of years. He's 61 years old. Um, he's designated SFI and he has a physical disability. He's been chronically homeless for, for decades now uh, and has a severe alcohol program problem. Comes in, doesn't have criminal charges, comes in and, as an incapacitated person, sobers up in the middle of the night. And I've got a superintendent calling me and going, what do I do with this gentleman who I legally have to let go and who has nowhere to go? Uh, and uh, I don't think I put it in there, but um, lodged in a facility, they lodge folks in the nearest facility that may still be some distance from where an individual is actually arrested, where their home community is. Um, so two more. Um, we recently had a 19 year old uh, who was extradited from the state of Connecticut, returned to the state of Vermont. He was in our custody for two days. Court saw him, uh, said, nope, we don't, we don't need to keep him in custody. Um, orders him released. He has no money. He has no phone. And all his people are in Connecticut. Uh, and again, we have a superintendent who's concerned. I have not much more than a kid here. In fact, the superintendent said, this gentleman's younger than my children and I'm releasing him and, and where are we going? Uh, and then this last one, um, gentleman was in for eight years. Uh, he was out in the community for two years and then he came back in for another 26 years. Um, he refused programming. That's part of the reason he stayed in for 26 years. Uh, designated a high risk sex offender. Um, he has a sister who was willing to provide some support, but the victim, the victim of his crime lives with her. So her amount of support was limited. Certainly she wasn't willing to have him live in her house and that seems appropriate. Um, he's in a wheelchair. Um, we call a number of assisted living places. He's a high risk sex offender who's refused programming. Nobody wanted to uh, take him. Homeless shelters refused because they couldn't meet his needs. Um, didn't quite hit the mark for choices for care. Um, he wanted to release to a specific community um, that doesn't have natural resources in it. He thought he had a truck and a camper. He was in for 26 years. That truck and camper weren't there anymore. Didn't believe us when we said it's not there. Uh, and for much of that time, he didn't want to work with us. Well, I'm all set. I don't want to work with corrections. When I max out, I'm going to walk out. I don't want to see you guys at all. We got about three weeks out from release. No, did I say three? About six weeks. I'm sorry. About six weeks out from release, and it kind of really struck home with him. Like, I'm going out, and I have no idea where I'm going. Now I want to work with you. That's a lot of barriers. I mean, that's a lot of challenges to find housing for somebody, no matter how much time I have. Um, and so staff do an incredible amount of work with these cases. Um, staff get very invested. Um, yep, Gary. We, with that case, the Maxwell case, we had people from central office call. We had, we had case workers, we had facility staff, we had the PO, we had myself calling every, we called every, I, I believe every homeless shelter in the state. At, at the last minute, we couldn't find the district to go. They all refused because of his even though he was in a wheelchair. That's an example of what we're up against with these cases. So again, those are those are four cases. Um, I think they're representative of some of the types of struggles we have, um, but each of those represents, not represents them. Each of those is a human being um, that, that we struggled to find an appropriate relief plan for. 
So I want to tie this up because we have folks who are coming in. We've got four people out in the hallway for the next bill, which deals with naming the building. Um, and then we've got DOC scheduled at 10 for healthcare issues. So we've got a full packed morning. I know you have some appendices, but I would just let the committee members go. Yeah, no, that, oh, we weren't going to go through those. Those are just provided for you um, for your leisure reading. So, Eric? No, no, I appreciate um, So what's the reentry philosophy of the Vermont Department of Corrections? What I've heard is an awful lot of least planning for the holistic reentry philosophy is what are we doing to prepare individuals under the custody to re-enter? That's a reentry. Josh, if I may, our, yeah, our motto is reentry starts at incarceration. We, we, at all, we take every effort possible to start working on that plan from day one because we know it's likely to get derailed. Um, so our, our philosophy is to apply all the resources we can with, with everything we have as far as casework. When someone's sentenced, they have a probation officer as well. Even if they're never going to be in the community, they have a probation officer to have that community time. We have transitional POs. I think what we do um, is we apply all the resources that are available to us. And then we often find that no matter what we do, um, things come along the way that are going to be challenges. But our our we are always trying to maximize the resources that are available to the individual in the community. And then we do it from the, the moment that they're sentenced. I, I understand that. But part of the entry preparation is what's available to address and prepare them to reacclimate themselves yeah. into society. Are we addressing through programming, that is a CBT programming that might fit their need? to help them overcome some of these barriers? What levels of other programming or opportunities do they have inside? We can't do it all on our own out in the community. We need that preparation inside. And I know you understand where I'm going, but what I've seen over the last couple of years is there's no longer BCI. There's no longer um, the print shop is what level of uh, programming is involved to help address some of the barriers to where they re-enter. Yeah, we can put together the, the best release plan, but there is some also level of opportunity that should be applied in the facility to prepare them to re-enter. No, and I, and I don't think we disagree with you at all, Eric, uh, Representative McGuire. Um, no, please, Eric. <laughs> we, we got it like that, Josh. Um, and, and, that, and, and I think that's not the part of the question we are prepared to answer today. Um, you know, and that's uh, Director Bush's shop really does a lot of that program piece. I know we do uh, some work with Voc Rehab. And so yeah, they just started the, oh my God, what's it called? Got the Southern work you doing. Oh yeah, and I don't remember what that's called. But that's also through that's also through Director Bushy Shop. It's through our programming yeah. uh, division. Um, and I think we came really to talk about more of the the nuts and bolts and the where you're going um, and services there. There is that entire other piece in terms of addressing needs and deficiencies. Um, and I, I think we could do another hour on that. Um, although yeah, I'd, I'd really ask, I'd really ask them to do it. Um, out there now. No, and, and that's a completely well, valid question because that's. The other half of the picture is the what, are half, we, yeah. it, what are we doing to address that? Um, whatever you mean. <laughs> I <laughs> scale I <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Uh, it's very quickly, like, Representative Brevard, you know, totally agree. I think obviously you know, that's why we've been working so closely with the Turning Point Centers um, and understanding the way as we scale that program and, and hopefully that funding comes through in BAA and it's extended right now, but to you know, scale that programming statewide. Um, as something that can help bridge that gap between, um, you know, incarcerated settings and the community. Uh, it's also why, you know, we listened to kind of follow the legislative intent uh, with justice reinvestment um, and put $240,000 into reentry services with the recovery component for women and why we made housing to be central um, to that RFP, which we're, I think, about to work in the next few weeks. I think you heard Ashley Messier um, speak about that. 
just last week about how important sober housing is, how rare it is to find that in the community, how much we struggle as a department to find residences for folks, which is why you know we're really trying to make uh, a housing first model central um, to our reentry philosophy as well. But just to jump on that just quickly, the housing first model is only adequate and appropriate for those that fit into that model. A true level of care for transitional housing is three three functions: intervention, stability, self sufficiency. We mainly have that housing first. That's more of on a self sufficiency individual going into their own place, and you got very few other opportunities. And you can reflect back. Mm -hmm. I believe we had the best model in Rome. I, I think I think we had some great success with that. And it was unfortunate how things came to pass, but I believe if we reestablish that that third level of care, it's gonna it's gonna have opportunities for those individuals that don't fit into what's currently available. And we do have the Pathways program as well, which does provide some support, you know, support beyond just that housing first um, for some of those folks who have the have the higher needs. Thank you. Soon and then we need to wrap it up. Well, I'll make this a lightning round if you're willing, Josh. Uh, me. thanks for coming in. It's really helpful. Just in a couple words, what we want to build on what's working or expand, make reentry more successful. Just what couple words come to mind? What do you need more of? Uh, what do you need? Yeah, I would like a more, more, more formal collaboration with the, with the designated agencies. I think like if there was some way to, um, I, I don't want to say necessarily prioritize, but just highlight in, and connect with and make sure the needs are met better um, so that we could connect our reentry process with the designated agencies from the onset. Um, I think that would be really helpful. Um, our internal Words. I, I'm not sure where you're going. Where you're going with this? It's a, it, it. I guess for for release purposes, it should be housing first because if you don't have a stable place to go and know where you're going to sleep tonight and know that there's at least a microwave so that you can eat something, um, but it needs to be person first. And is the person ready for release? And do the, does the person feel that he has a connection to the community that he's releasing to? Does he have buy-in for sobriety and clean living? Does he have buy-in and the ability to go get a job somewhere? We can make all the best release plans in the world, but if guy is not the number one part of it, then it doesn't work. You can't legislate that. I know. Okay, this is helpful. What I wanna do at some point later on this week when we had some time on like a committee discussion in terms of what the next step would be in terms of testimony. Probably one thing that would work would be getting Kim Bushy in to really talk about programming, but also um, we're also looking at the medical piece of this because that's a big piece of reentry. And I know that Eric brought up BCI and the print shop and the license plates. And that's and that, is, that is Kim's shop. And I think that'd be great. A lot of that has been. We still do license plates. I believe we do. Yeah, yeah. 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 all this. We still do the one skill that no one man can take with them when they leave. <laughs> but a lot of this has been um, scaled back. Due well, to I, I, I know they've some been. Some of it has been scaled back due to other forces at play. And I think the committee needs to see this. And also, it's a budget issue, too. Yeah. I wouldn't, you know, and I don't think it's all scaling back. I know, and, and Kim will speak to it better than, than I can, but they've, there's been a lot of refocus, refocus and rebuilding. And I don't, I don't know that we're a hundred percent there yet, um, but they've done a lot to sort of tear down a model that wasn't always working for us and get a new model up and running. And, and I, I would leave it to Kim to speak to that. And that's what we need to, to um, take further testimony on so we can see the whole picture here. Just, can I do one quick okay. clarification? Uh, so there's no formal collaboration with the designated agencies. What would be required to have? Well, I'd say that um, we're, we're, our population is essentially just like anyone else. Like they, they really, there's nothing that um, sort of drives a, a formal connection before release to the designated agencies. That's what I would like to see. 
um, that, you know, if there's some sort of way, there's some sort of program that, um, you know, we, we start connecting and figuring out what those needs are going to be along the way. So is that a policy within DOC to do that? Or There's a few different ways to skim the cat on that. Um, I think how it's structured with DMH, um, I think, you know, it, it possibly could be how, um, how DMH uh, kind of their oversight of those designated agencies is coordinated. I think that could probably be tweaked. Um, yeah. Or would it require statute change? Um, that would certainly wouldn't hurt. Um, but I don't know if that's the best way to do it. So I'm going to have to close this because we got folks out in the hallway waiting. <clears throat> we'll have you folks back, I'm sure. Um, but I do want some committee time at some point to talk about where we're headed. So let's transition. Yeah. We need to take a personal break. Committee members do it quickly, but I'm, we're not taking a break. We're running behind really fast. What time would you like us back? Um, I hope that we're done by quarter after 10. Okay. It's my hope. Um, so if folks who are out in the hallway could come in, if someone could say to them, they're welcome in. I mean, like, there's any model plans, but I don't think there's any model input. Come on in, folks. We're not moving. Yeah, yeah. Mary, I'm going to put you right in the hot seat. Put you right in the hot seat first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sideways. Mm -hmm. So, if someone could close the doors, so we can get started. I'm sorry, we're just running late. Uh, this other one just got been here before. <laughs> You've been here for this. Yeah. This isn't her first rodeo. <laughs> so we're shifting gears for folks who are on YouTube. We're shifting gears to a bill that's in our committee. Um, it's been <clears throat> introduced by some committee members. Um, the bill would be renaming a building in the Capitol complex, um, which would be the first time we've ever named a building in a Capitol complex. Um, after former Governor Phil Hawk and um, former member Mary Sullivan has been spearheading us for a number of years. And we thought it would be good to bring you in, have you go over your thoughts. Um, and hear questions. So welcome. Thank you so much. And um, first of all, I just really want to thank um, everybody who's been here today for inviting us in. Um, this bill really does mean a lot to many people. And the one beautiful thing is how, uh, when I was here and I'm promoting it in 2020, nothing got through if it wasn't COVID related in 2020, but um, how many Republicans spoke so well? And I realized as I looked more into um, Bill Hoth and you know his years of governor, how, how well he worked across the aisle and uh, you know, had friends everywhere. I had a great chat with top McFawn, um, about how he came up here to work in state government when Phil was um, when Phil was governor and um, Brian Savage was thrilled he's not here anymore I realize but um, so um, before I get into all the bullet points on why I feel that this should be named after Phil Hoff I wanted to introduce um, Jogney Hoff uh, Phil's daughter um, Phil and Joan were blessed with four daughters um, Richard Cassidy here was kind of considered the son he never had. <laughs> uh, he worked in the law firm. He was partners with him in the law firm, like forever. Um, so I just wanted to introduce um, those two. This got started because um, Paul Carnahan, who was the librarian of the State Historic Society, um, approached Mary um, Hooper, who was then um, a state rep from Montpelier to say that he was doing a lot of research on the Phil Hoff years, and they really thought that this building should be named after him. And uh, so she had introduced uh, um, a bill uh, right away. And um, that's how I think when people heard about it, they're like, oh yeah, that, that is what should happen. Um, so a little list of some of the things that uh, Governor Hoff did. Um, I love my own story, which is um, I used to freelance write out, um, during the session the first time I served in the 90s. And I was writing a 30 year history of the State Housing Authority. And I thought, oh, Phil was governor back then. I wonder if he remembers anything about this. Well, not only did he remember, uh, 
the state housing authority would not be here without Phil Hoff. Uh, when the Great Society legislation was coming through, he um, there were city housing authorities in it. And Phil thought, Burlington's probably the only community back then that has the number of people and the you know structure, our city structure, to create a city housing authority. Um, we need a state housing authority in Vermont. So he called HUD, but, um, that no, no, sorry, city authority. He then called the White House. The White House called HUD and said, we're having state housing authority. So, uh, and you think of how much good that that housing authority has done over the decades um, that we wouldn't have had if it weren't for uh, Bill's persistence. Um, so he modernized state government. And I think um, a lot of people do know that, but uh, he opened the first state planning office he ended the municipal overseers of the poor and instituted a state welfare system. He led successful efforts to create the Vermont District Court, the Judicial Nominating Board, the Governor's Commission on Women, the Vermont Council on the Arts, and the Vermont Student Assistance Corporation. Uh, Governor Hoff's regional regionalization initiatives encompassed airports and libraries. His leadership was essential in the successful multi-branch um, process to reapportion the General Assembly and establish one person, one vote in the legislature. He was also considered a pioneering advocate for racial justice and civil rights. Uh, he was way ahead of his time in that. Uh, as a state rep, he introduced anti-employment discrimination legislation. As governor, he signed a later version of this bill into law. He fought for the adoption of the landmark Federal Civil Rights Act of 64. He urged the abolition of UVM's racial emb racially embarrassing cakewalk. Uh, he spearheaded the establishment of the Vermont Human Rights Commission. He co-founded the Vermont New, uh, New York Youth Project, which brought minority youngsters to Vermont in order to enjoy our state's natural resources. Uh, he insisted on a fair investigation after the shooting of a black minister in Irisburg. Um, as an attorney, and Richard could certainly speak more to this than I could, um, he uh, played a leadership role in the establishment of mandatory continuing legal education as chair of the Judicial Nominating Board. He was a visionary president of the Vermont Law School Board of Trustees. Um, Governor Hoff promoted the purchase of the Canadian hydropower as an alternative to the construction of the Vermont nuclear power plant. Uh, I worked between my two stints in the legislature. I worked at Burlington Electric Department. And people still bemoan the fact that this um, power was not bought by hydro, um, Canadian hydro. Yes, um, because I, it would have saved the state millions and millions of dollars. Um, among the nation's Democratic governors, Phil Hoff was bravely the first to oppose President Lyndon Johnson's Vietnam policies. Um, he was a proud World War II U.S. Navy mariner, submariner. Um, the Capitol complex, as currently constituted, can be attributed in large measure to the 1965 master plan issued during the Hoff administration. Um, I believe that 133 State Street was the first building that was brought into the um, Capitol complex. And that's why Paul Carnahan, uh, who initially did this research, really thought that this was the appropriate um, building to name after him. Um, so I don't know if you do, but when I come down State Street, I see, um, you know, the two avenues named after former governors that go up to the State House. And I think about them. I see their names. I mean, I did meet George Aiken once when I was young. And um, so I would love to have this building, you know, named. And the three of them, you know, would be one, two, three. And, you know, 50 years from now, kids would be walking down that street and thinking of these former governors and hopefully, you know, maybe doing a little research um, and uh, finding out how they contributed to the state. And I think history is very important to all of us. Um, and also, if anybody wants any more information, Richard brought um, that book that was released maybe, I don't know, eight or nine years ago, it's 10 no, years ago. Um, Almost 15 years old. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when he signed my copy. Um, we have enough for the committee, so uh, feel free to 
take one. As a former member, I know I didn't want big things left on my desk that I didn't want. So uh, we'll be happy to just let you decide whether you want to grab a book or not. And if you don't mind, if there's any questions, if um, they've known Bill longer and better, um, if it would be allowed to just let me buck a question that I think they can answer better. So we've been talking about this as a committee for a little bit last week, and there's a lot of concerns um, from committee members about opening up the can of worms of naming buildings and capital complex. There's, and, I'm been, and I also heard from uh, capital complex commission that they're really concerned about this as well, and that it could become a political bidding frenzy for naming other buildings. How, how is that approached? You know, we've got some other large buildings. Uh, 133 isn't the only one that's large. We have 120 State Street. Who do we name that one after that was involved in transportation? We have the pavilion. Which governor do we name that one after? We have the Secretary of State's office. We have the Auditor of Accounts office. I mean, it's the seat of state government. So we haven't named any buildings in the capital complex prior to this request. So there's a lot of concern in terms of how that opens up the door. Um, so that's one piece. Um, other folks have some issues of trying to figure out, do we name or do we not name after Governor Hoff? Um, another thing that we're sort of looking at, is there a neutral type of entity that we could work in or, or put in place a pro an entity that would determine how we name buildings and what buildings would be named. Because currently we have the Department of Library. There's a real process within the Department of Library to name geographic areas. And folks that want a geographic area would uh, submit a petition to the Board of Libraries about a certain geographic area that they would like named after someone. And then there's a procedure to go through. Uh, the Transportation Board has the same type of situation for naming bridges and roads, um, that there is a formal process. And, and is this some, something that we as a committee look at? Is there some entity there that there would be a formal process for naming state-owned buildings? Because there's nothing in place. We really want to depoliticize. Whenever you get into naming anything, it's a real political issue. So those two entities, the Department of Libraries and the Transportation Board have really done, we've taken testimony from them and tried to figure out how they've set up their process in terms of naming geographic areas or roads and bridges. So that's another avenue that we're looking at. Um, we know Governor Hoff, you've listed a long list of achievements that he's done. And there might be some other opportunities there of naming something else after him besides 133 State Street. And then there are some folks that may not want to continue doing any names. So we've got a lot of um, thoughts in the committee. So just open it up to folks who have questions or thoughts. Uh, Tristan and then Troy. Okay. <clears throat> you sure? Mm -hmm. Hi, Mary. We haven't met. Um, yeah, for Hedrick, I'm also from Burlington. So it's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Um, yeah. Here are my I, one, I am 100% certain, based on what I know of the governor's track record, that I would be completely aligned with him from a policy perspective and from a priorities perspective. I'm certain of that. And um, everything you've listed. Um, kind of adds up to a collection of instances that have helped define Vermont as the state that it is and truly pivoted the state, I think, in ways that I wholeheartedly appreciate. For me, this, um, I, I, have to, I have to look at the question you're asking us to consider through the equity lens. And when I consider how this country and this state was colonized, was founded, um, the, the foundational racism that pervades that founding, um, the foundational misogyny that, that 
pervades that, that founding. And I start thinking about who has had access to the processes by which we become aware of those great things that is primarily white men. Um, and there are certainly some exceptions and there are certainly some amazing um, exceptions here in Vermont. That, that's what I worry about is that as we start thinking about naming structures, really the, the, the vast majority of, of people who would be on that list for consideration are white and are men. Um, and there's no structure in place right now to apply that equity lens from an ob objective perspective as we start thinking about do we want to name structures and then who should be on the list of, of recipients. I don't know if you have thoughts on that, but that's, that's my biggest concern here. Um, yeah, as I look at buildings that are already named airports that were recently named, um, yeah, that those those are my concerns. I, and I understand that concern for sure. Um, a lot of you know places are named after white men. The only thing I would ask the committee to do is, when you look at Bill Hoff's accomplishments, he was really the one who broke open state government certainly to help let um, you know women and people of color in. You know, he tried to get rid of that misogyny and that racism that definitely so existed. And, you know, buildings in the state are named after some of them. Yeah, um, so I, I just I truly think that. Um, I mean, his accomplishments just never should be forgotten. And I don't think there's a better way to have them remembered than having the building next to the state house mm -hmm. named. And it was the first, I'm quite sure it was, the, it was okay, thank you. Um, the first bill, uh, building that was brought into the state capital complex that, that he helped create. So our government functions so much better now. Yeah, no disagreement. Questions, Kirsten? Um, yeah, I really wanna thank you for coming in and. Sure. Sure. And I have, a, I have a little hearing loss. Uh, um, excuse me. Sometimes I speak too quietly. <laughs> I want to thank you for coming in uh, and sharing about governor. Didn't have the opportunity to encounter him myself. So I always love learning. What a wonderful chance. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, I said, we talked about this as a committee before you, uh, you know, the last couple of weeks and something I said to the committee, I'll just say to you directly as well. I, I was just, being, feeling disinclined to name buildings in the capital complex for people. I think for the, similar to what Chair Emmons said, it feels like you start to, you name one and you're gonna to start to name everything. And uh, to me as a newcomer in Montpelier, I'm really proud to take part in the citizen legislature is what it's considered. And there feel, there's really something about the spirit of that that I, uh, I think that's like the best of governance in Vermont. Um, and so to me, like sort of as a statement that's been made that we haven't named any of these buildings as of yet. And maybe that says something about the kind of government that- I'm sorry, you haven't named anything after- Anything in the capital complex yet. And, and yeah. I think that's, I, I, I like that. I, I guess I'll just say it's my, been my honest feeling. Um, I think I'd be more open to looking at a, a state buildings you know, another state building somewhere else that's more operational. And that might be a place where you could tell more a story of, of the governor and his impact on, on something more hands-on than sort of, I think some, sometimes these buildings get named and you really don't know anything about the person and that's not doing them a great service. So I guess that's just about my feedback. I don't have a question really, but you're welcome to comment. Um, the only thing I um, would want to say is that what Phil Hoff accomplished in his six years as governor was was unbelievable. It really was. And um, I just want, you know, when school kids are marching up that street and they, you know, and they look at these two other avenues that um, that, that will remember, they'll be reminded of these governors, uh, you know, that I, I think that's really important to understand what government can do for people. Thank you. And I've heard also that line, if you start naming it after one, um, Phil was special. He really was. So like the other people that people may think, that's what we got to balance here. That's what we have to balance. Yeah. I mean, you know, we've named a lot of buildings after, ju uh, after um, you know, judges um, and, and other things. And 
difference. You know, I feel like if if the committee does its work and says, oh, yes, this person does stand above the rest, that, that it's a legitimate reason to do that. Well, I think you mentioned work, and I think that's another thing that's come up is that we've seen what the Board of Libraries does with naming geographic locations and what the transportation folks do. And there's a lot of work, a lot of community, a lot of listening, a lot of research. So I just want to also say, I was really impressed with the amount of work that they put into it. And wanting, if we were to approach this, would really want to think about a really good due process for it. Other folks? Nobody dare speak. <laughs> <laughs> so you've given a lot of food for thought in terms of other items that might be able to be named for him. I mean, he was instrumental in establishing uh, VSAC, he was instrumental in establishing a uh, Human Rights Commission, a Governor's Commission on Women, Civil Rights Issues, uh, Educational Issues. I'm just wondering if there's other avenues. I mean, it just seems like it's just stuck on 133 State Street, but are there other avenues that would be available to name after Governor Hoff? Um, I would put that out there for people to start thinking because he was so innovative in many other arenas. Um, and I don't know if the committee, I think the committee is interested in looking at setting up a structure similar to what the Board of Libraries goes through and the Transportation Board to have a real neutral um, body that has a process in place for how buildings, state buildings are named uh, and not leave it to the political whim of um, of this building. And um, so that's sort of where we are as a committee is the conversations that we've had. Um, I'll be upfront, the committee is resistant to naming the building. They're not, some folks are resistant to naming anything and other folks are open to their other avenues um, and do we set up a formal process that's out of the legislative arena for naming buildings? Just the same as roads and bridges and geographic areas for that. I know folks don't want to hear this, but that's the conversation sweet. Sure, can, yes. can I speak for a moment? <laughs> I'm Richard Cassidy. I, I worked with the governor for 36 years um, and I'm a native Vermonter. And like you, Karen, I'm old enough to remember Phil. Oh, I remember him. I know you do. Um, and I remember the sleepy little state that I was born in, um, where being a Catholic was um, a, a, a matter of potential uh, attack by the Ku Klux Klan in the state. And, and I remember uh, from my days in elementary school, when Phil was governor and when he came to my school, and I just remember that he changed this state in a way that I don't think any other single individual within living memory has done. Soon his accomplishments won't be within living member, memory either. Um, and um, I, I just think it's very important that his legacy, particularly his legacy of trying to make this state um, a state that was more equitable, that was interested and cared about um, uh, equality for African Americans, cared about equality for women, um, that, that that accomplishment, that, that change in the state be remembered in a very significant way. Um, I'm proud to say that the eulogy that I gave for Governor Hoff was um, put into the congressional record uh, by Senator, Standard, Senator Sanders, and I have a lovely plaque that I would be delighted to donate to this purpose that, that summarizes his accomplishments in one page. Um, I, I think we're at risk of losing this memory, and um, I urge you to take action and take action now. Um, I'm 70, you know, and uh, those of us who work with Phil and knew what he did both publicly and also privately for, for many years. 
his law practice consisted of this. People who were in trouble and who didn't know where else to turn would come to see the governor and beg him to fix their problems. And of course, he wasn't the governor, and, and even if he had been, he didn't have the ability to fix their problems. But he tried hard for those people to find a way for them to, to solve the, the dilemmas that they faced. Often they were people who were in recovery or, or needed to be in recovery. Of course, Phil was proud to be an alcoholic in recovery. And uh, I, I, just, I just urge you not to, not to delay, but to take action. Yes, I'd like to see 133 states. Be. I'd like to see it because it is prominent. Um, but I'd like to see something, something soon. That's more important to me. I urge those of you who are interested in the history, please take a copy of the book. Uh, I think you'll find it's quite an extraordinary life and quite an extraordinary contribution to making Vermont the progressive, thoughtful uh, place that we live in today. Thank you. I appreciate having a chance to say a few words. I'd be happy to answer questions if that's appropriate to Any questions or comments? Anyone else? Want to, do you want to weigh in? Well, I'm obviously um, a believer that in every case, I'm 72. So, um, and I was 11 when my father was gone. First got home. I remember the state. Um, I also worked for the state for my entire career. Um, and I worked in the council of aging as well. Um, I live in Montpelier. I have friends that live here. Have businesses here. I have friends that work at 133 State um, who are not Democratic people, but they're Republican, but they believe very strongly that that would be a great thing. I believe that my father was a bit of an icon in this, in this country and in this state. And I think we've forgotten what he did. And I think this book will remind people that I also, I remember marching against the war in Vietnam during the governor's conference and my father saying, yay for you. I mean, it, I'm not a very political person. I may have been thought to have been one at one time, but I'm not. And um, at the same time, I have the utmost of respect for both of my parents and for my father's accomplishments and my mother for her support. And I don't know that this is so much just about the hop me. I think it's the hop symbol. It's a symbol of something that I think I'm proud of. I, I, I look at my father, somebody who did so much. I remember just even going to church when I was young, and there was one black family in that church. He created a state that was a welcoming place, a place for people to, to come and create community. And I am very strongly part of that belief system. So, it would be an honor. More than honor. So you want something visible and something where people coming into coming into Montpelier would see see his name. Yes. And and go, who is that man? And what did he do for the state? Why is his name? I mean, I can think of a number of other reasons to name other buildings about other people and you're thinking about women, you know, which women, no. At the same time, I think my father paved that road for so many, so many of you. I mean, I don't know. It's just, I'm not the eloquent speaker here, and I didn't expect this. So, well, we wanted to give you an opportunity. Yeah. Sure. I just, I co signed this bill, and I just want to go on the record that I think it would be fitting to uh, name a, a building after Governor Hoff. Um, yeah, he was a Excellent governor, and as has been mentioned <clears throat> throughout this conversation, that he was a um, was at the forefront of so many issues that faced us back in those days. And I, I'm older than most everybody here, <laughs> and so <clears throat> I remember those <clears throat> those days very well. And, uh, I just want to go on record that I would support. I think it's a fitting thing. And, you know, they named a bridge in Derby after Kerm Smith, who was a, 
former senator and sergeant at arms. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it does happen. Uh, and I just start with it. <clears throat> Um, could I just add one thing that when I was uh, talking to uh, Senator Leahy about this, uh, his response is, I'm perplexed why that man has never gotten the recognition that he so deserves. And Howard Dean actually told me that he thought Phil Hoff was the best governor the state has ever had. Uh, I don't think there's anybody in the room that doubts or the importance of the, everything that the governor did for the state. And I'm one of the old ones, so um, I remember. And, and being uh, with a little last name like like this, I, yeah. I remember what was going on back in those days yeah. in terms of Catholics. And, for, and I had that problem within my own family, right? And I understand the, you know, the, the women would be separated into Catholic versus other groups are going on. A lot of those things changed through the men didn't have that problem because they, they worked out in the parking lot. <laughs> but but so but the, really the issue is is it the building or is it to have something where that's prominent enough that would provide people to have the attention to Governor Hoff and be able to ask those questions. Who is who was he? What has he done? So, so, the, so my, I'm asking the question, does this have to be a building or could we find something else that would be as prominent that would, that would, uh, would achieve the goal that you really want, which is recognition of Governor Hoff? May I respond? Sure. Um, no, I think it's appropriate that it be a building. Um, for one thing, it allows there to be some sort of plaque or, you know, um, eulogy or something there as a place where people can stop and look. Um, I, 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 I wouldn't sit here and say, oh, this is the only building it can be. But it does have certain prominence in the capital complex. And, and I think it's a, it would be appropriate prominence. I don't think it's such a bad thing for you to spend a few minutes or a few hours over the course of, of uh, uh, the term of the legislature to decide what should be named for people. Um, and maybe make some decisions I wouldn't agree with so much. But those who have contributed to our past shouldn't be forgotten. You know, I don't think Madeleine King would have been governor, but for Phil Hoff. Her first start in politics was on the governor's commission on women. She was on the initial commission that Phil established. Um, so those, those accomplishments are in jeopardy of being forgotten, and something significant should be done soon. It'll be easy to delay and say, we're going to think about this. What will probably happen with delay is it right now. You do understand our concern is not I do. about that. It's about, it's about the deluge that we might have of naming and renaming because everything that gets named, if we start doing that, could be renamed and on and on and on. And, uh, you know, can we avoid that or can we make a process that, but if we make a process, then somebody's going to get left out someplace. And, but I, I can't even think of another person who made the changes for the state that Phil made, uh, Governor Hoff made. Um, he's, he really stood above most others. Um, and I wouldn't argue. I said I wouldn't argue. I don't, I mean, that's why I, I, you know, I loved working on this and whatever to see, you know, Democrats, Republicans, um, you know, others who just were, uh, knew the man. And, um, you know, I loved uh, Representative McLean's story about how he came up here when Phil Hoff was governor and worked for, um, worked in state government his whole career. Um, So, Michelle. Um, I'll just make a quick comment. comment. Um, so I was a, um, a teacher, among other things, before I came uh, to the legislature. And I really appreciated, I mean, actually, a lot of what you just shared was was new to me, even though I taught history to middle schoolers. Um, and I would love a copy of your book to learn, to learn more about his life. And I do feel like he sounds like someone who we should honor in a way that our children and our adults learn about him. 
we have a month until crossover and I don't know we have time to determine the naming of a building and all that goes along with that. But I do hope that we find something that we can use to honor him and help people learn about his legacy because it does sound like he's really important and he does deserve to be remembered and recognized and, and to inspire others. So thanks. I was proud of her book. I did oh, for the book. just basically just again say thanks. And I, again, I didn't know Bill Hopper, but I feel I know him better now. And you, you've done, you know, I think you've done a solid thing for our history by coming in here today. Thank you. Anything else? Oops. I make just one mm -hmm. little last statement. I do fear that um, delaying um, and getting into building a process before this happens, I do fear that it won't happen. Um, and I know so, so many people around the state who really want this to happen and give him the recognition he deserves. <clears throat> I don't think anyone's opposed to the recognition that's deserved. I think it's finding the right venue for that. It's the issue. Any other questions? <laughs> thank you, folks, for coming in. Yeah, thank, you. thank you for your time. Well, thank you very it's much. Much appreciated. So much. I want to touch thank you. Yeah. So let's take a quick break. Let's go off with you to take.